Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 830 on Wednesday, June 16th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, a Mississippi coast city becomes the first of its kind to recognize Pride Month. Then a move to advance women's representation in state government and an emerging environmental justice coalition aims high. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Ocean Springs Mayor Shea Dobson signed a proclamation last week formally recognizing June as LGBTQ Pride Month in his city. He's the first municipal leader along Mississippi's coast to do so. Speaking with MPB's Ashley Norwood, Dobson says the decision to acknowledge Pride was an easy one. We have people who will reach out for proclamations all the time. Our our website has a section where you can request it for a variety of reasons. You know, usually I try to I try to honor their request. My assistant will work with them and you know figure out the right language and all of that. But yeah, when I saw this come through, I fully support you know the gay community and thought it was a uh, you know a good gesture to uh, to make. So yeah, we're just uh, really proud to you know be the first on the coast to uh, to recognize Pride. Do you expect to have any pushback, or have you had any pushback at all? Not a whole lot. I mean, you know, of course, everybody is entitled to their opinion, and you know, and that's fine. But you know, I, I feel like most people have, you know, been in support of it, or you know, at the very least, just um, you know, just choose to look the other way. What do you think about the role um, people like yourself, mayors, you know, municipal leaders, have in creating uh, anti-discriminatory uh, policies and et cetera, especially when you have some advocates who say that at the state level it's not happening for members of the LGBTQT community? I, I typically haven't thought about myself uh, or any elected official being a, um, you know, a leader or you know, uh, at, at least an authority, if you will, uh, towards social issues. I think that, you know, regardless of what, you know, any one politician thinks that, um, you know, that doesn't affect the way that I, I live my life and, you know, that I relate to my community and that I relate to my friends and family. And so, you know, it's good to, it's good to, um, you know, to have, to be open-minded and it's good to, uh, you know, to, for elected officials to, you know, recognize all of their constituents. Um, you know, however, I would just, uh, I don't think that, um, I, I don't, I don't necessarily look towards politicians for, um, you know, my morality or, or anything such as that. So, um, you know, I always just look towards, you know, my community and my friends. And, and I think here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, it's, um, you know, we're very, uh, welcoming all the people and, um, you know, businesses and such are, are very open to, to everyone, regardless of, you know, race or sexual identity or anything such as that. And so, um, you know, I, I, I feel like, I feel like, you know, I feel like we're, we're pretty open and we, um, we always want to celebrate everyone, um, you know, regardless of, you know, a proclamation or, you know, the words of any one individual. So, but, you know, with that being said, uh, it, it is good to, um, you know, formally put a, a stamp of approval on, on things. And so I'm glad that I could, uh, could do that. And I'm glad that, um, you know, I, I could just uh, be here for, you know, everyone in the community who uh, wants to feel accepted. Mayor Shea Dobson, uh, Mayor of Ocean Springs, thank you so much for speaking with us. We really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Rob Hill is the director of the Mississippi chapter of the Human Rights Campaign. He says the state needs to do much more to ensure its LGBTQ population is celebrated and protected. But that's not to say symbolic actions like Mayor Dobson's aren't important. I don't know of many pride proclamations that have been in cities around the, in many other places around the state. That doesn't mean that they haven't, but certainly this was um, welcome news in Ocean Springs. You know, I don't know why that hasn't happened. I think that Certainly part of it is there's reluctance by many because of the stigma that exists around being LGBTQ and conservative religious beliefs that are often based in someone's, what I would call erroneous religious teaching that has contributed to the lack of recognition. 
but but yeah, I mean, when these happen, when these things happen, they should be celebrated, and we should note that. And and I hope that other cities do that. It means a lot to LGBTQ people. I also, you know, really think that it means a lot to LGBTQ youth. I want to talk about um, earlier this year, we know Governor Tate Reeves signed a bill to ban transgender athletes from competing on girls or women's sports teams. And, uh, you know, I've seen you personally at the Capitol year after year. There's been the fight to update Mississippi's hate crime laws to protect members of the LGBTQT community. Um, What are your thoughts on protections and rights for LGBTQT community at the state level in Mississippi? Well, obviously, we've got a lot of work to do, and there's a lot of resistance to, to any kind of statewide non-discrimination law. And in fact, what we've seen very often is laws that are intended to discriminate uh, or perpetuate discrimination against the LGBTQ community. Certainly, the anti-trans uh, athlete law that was passed this year was another example of this governor and, and many in our legislature's uh, desire to continue to disenfranchise the LGBTQ community. This law was specifically about trans people. It's a new iteration of the attempts to roll back rights for LGBTQ people, and this is one of those bills, uh, unfortunately, which were too many this year that were passed, uh, as we saw an onslaught of anti-LGBTQ legislation. So as a result of that, it's incumbent upon cities uh, and municipalities to pass local non-discrimination protections. We've seen several cities around the state do that, Jackson being the first in 2016. You mentioned Jackson there. I want to ask you, I know the the human rights campaign, there's the municipal equality index. Is there a city in Mississippi that's doing well or one that ranks poorly in terms of policies and leadership stances on LGBTQ rights or protections? Yeah, the, the, the municipal equality index is the, obviously the benchmark for measuring what kind of protections or policies that are in place on the municipal level that impact LGBTQ people in a positive way. Jackson is actually leading the way. They this year scored well above the national average uh, with, a, with a score of 80 out of 100. And there are other cities around the state that, that made increases this past year. Hattiesburg was one of those. Also, um, Biloxi was one of those who doubled their score this year. But we, and we anticipate that a lot of cities around the state will do that this year, and we're working hard. Uh, you know, one of the places that, sadly, we've seen no um, no increase and no effort to, to make an increase is South Haven. It gets a zero. And, you know, there, there are just as many people in South Haven uh, who are LGBTQ uh, on average as there are in, in many of the other cities that, uh, that we measure. But we hope a lot of these cities will, will come around. There are cities that are scoring low that should do better, like like Oxford and, and Starkville, cities that are known for their inclusivity and their and the kind of welcome that they roll out. But yet those policies are not in place. Uh, as somebody said to me today, we are an inclusive city in town. We just haven't done the per- paperwork. And that's what we're really trying to get these cities to do is to, to pass measurable, tangible policies that, that send the message that LGBTQ people are safe and welcome in their communities. And that definitely impacts their their score in a positive way. Rob Hill, State Director of the Human Rights Campaign in Mississippi, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. It's, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you for having me. Coming up, a national gender parity fund wants more women in the Mississippi State Legislature. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. Less than 15% of Mississippi state legislators are women. With a splashy investment, a notable gender parity fund hopes to change that. The Ascend Fund says it will give up to $180,000 to nonpartisan Mississippi nonprofits to help boost the number of women elected to state government. Speaking with MPB's Desiree Frazier, Fund Director Abby Hodgson outlines the philosophy behind that commitment. We believe that there are really critical policy decisions that are made by state legislators, and Mississippi is ranked 48th in the nation for the number of women serving in the state legislature. So we'd like to make an initial investment to recruit and train more women to run for the state legislature in hope of getting 
good, stable policies as an outcome for the state. For Mississippi, what organizations will be able to receive those grants? So we are looking for nonpartisan, nonprofit organizations in Mississippi who share our commitment to gender and racial equity. Ideally, they have some experience working with women or working in leadership development. But um, overall, it is just that they have an interest in doing this work and in increasing women's representation. 180000 while it sounds like a large sum, when it comes to campaigning, it may not be that much, correct? Yes and no. Um, so first, we view this as an initial investment in the 2022 election cycle. And keep in mind that this is non-profit, non-partisan dollars that will be invested early in the pipeline at cultivating and recruiting women. This isn't money that will be invested in campaigns themselves. So we recognize that campaigns are very expensive endeavors. So yes, 180000 might not go a long way when it comes to advertising and campaign spending. But we anticipate that we will be able to train and recruit a large number of women through the organizations that we invest in. Would you speak to the issue of the concern about bringing more women into the political theater? We believe that women, because of their unique life experience, govern differently than men do. And you see that in their willingness and ability to reach across the aisle. They're more likely to seek compromise and find bipartisan solutions. Additionally, they're more likely to advocate for policies that benefit women, children, and family, again, because these are very unique life experiences. And when they're not represented at the policy table, it means that those needs oftentimes go unmet. Um, So those are just two of the very important reasons why we believe that women in Mississippi deserve to have an equal number of seats at at the policy table. Where does your money come from to do this? Our organization received seed funding from Pivotal Ventures, which is an investment company founded by Melinda French Gates. We also have a number of individual corporate and foundation donors who support our work. Have you been able to ascertain why Mississippi is ranked so low when it comes to electing women for the Mississippi legislature? So Mississippi is not an outlier um, when you look at their region. Southern states in general um, rank low for women's representation, which tells us that there are a lot of historical and cultural norms that have restricted women's progress um, in the region. Um, So that will be one thing that we will ask the organizations to really dig into. How do we address issues of sexism and racism and overcome them and empower women to um, recognize within themselves the leadership potential that they have, but also um, empower voters to recognize those qualities within the women and that there are positive policy outcomes for all involved when we elect more women. Anything that I didn't ask you that is important to mention? One is the fact that there are no campaign finance limits on campaigns for the state legislature. And traditionally, men have raised about 30 percent more than women running for the state legislature in Mississippi. And so that's one aspect that we'll want to dig into of how we overcome the power of incumbency, the access to traditional networks, um, and oftentimes just the cultural norm of it being impolite for women to talk about money. And then the second is even though there are an equal number of Democratic and Republican women um, serving in the Mississippi legislature, That's disproportionate given the party composition of the legislature. Obviously, um, there are far more Republicans serving in the legislature overall, so it skews Democrats for women as a proportion of of elected officials. Abby Hodgson, Mm -hmm. director of the Ascend Fund, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us about this effort to elect more women to the Mississippi State Legislature. That's right. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you for bringing attention to this important cause. Coming up, a new generation of environmental activists sprout sprout up along the climate-battered Gulf Coast. That's after a Southern Remedy Health Minute. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. 
I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Pediatrics and Internal Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and this is a Southern Remedy Health Minute. My question is, chronic pain from um, injury over half a lifetime ago, the transverse crack in the C7. I don't have pain all the time. But when I do, sometimes it's so substantial that I cannot sleep through it. I don't want to live as an an, an opioid addict. When you talk about chronic pain, there are some situations where you you've done everything that you can to try to you know to mitigate that so you can continue doing what you need to do, but you have to sleep, right? That's a necessity. Getting uh, good quality sleep is important, and it can affect. If you don't get it, it can affect all kinds of other things. Some medications help better with chronic pain. Uh, that aren't opioids. Um, There are several medications that work for some people. Things like Lyrica and Gabapentin, particularly taking at night, uh, they have a nice side effect of making you sleepy, but they're really treating the chronic pain. And then another one that's uh, fairly new, it's not been used that long, a few years, is Cymbalta or Duloxetine. So that is a, um, it was initially marketed for depression and anxiety, but what they found is it does have some uh, positive um, implications for treating chronic pain of really any kind of any kind of source. For more health tips and medical information, listen to Southern Remedy each weekday morning at 11 on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is MPB Think Radio. Mississippi is our mission. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. Natural disasters, crumbling infrastructure, and poverty are among many Mississippi communities' most serious concerns. A growing coalition of nonprofits and activist organizations believes it can address all three. Gulf South for a Green New Deal launched in 2019 as a formation of organizations throughout the Deep South aiming to advance, in their words, climate, racial, and economic justice. Jennifer Crossland is a regional organizer for the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy. She says environmental justice looks a little different in every state. In Mississippi, I can tell you that the priorities are housing, water and sewer infrastructure, and energy uh, and energy justice. And that transition from dirty, extractive fossil fuel um, energy to clean, renewable energy, such as solar and wind. We have leaders that are uninformed and unaware about the severity uh, and the scope of the climate crisis. And so we have some opportunity to do some education, not only in terms of like elected officials, but also um, in other decision makers, but also the general public. So that is certainly one of the priorities is to to talk about the climate crisis, how it's, it's impacting everyday folks. In addition to connecting the climate crisis to issues that people are and experience every day, right? So, for example, the winter storms that happened that came through Jackson, Mississippi, and the water crisis that resulted from it. This is the kind of thing that we're, we can anticipate and know that we'll get more of. And we know that the solution to addressing the climate crisis is the same solution for addressing the water crisis issue in the first place. We know we need water and sewer infrastructure upgrades, right? We know we need to have better housing inspections and regulations and so forth to make sure that people are safe within storms. So these aren't new policy solutions or ideas. This isn't new work. This is just a new sort of umbrella and framework for understanding and advancing the thing that should already be happening in the first place. 
Carlton Turner is director of the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production, a partner organization of Gulf South for a Green New Deal. Speaking with Desiree Frazier, Turner lays out what he's trying to achieve. We started the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production in Utica, Mississippi in 2017 to basically address issues of food sovereignty and, um, and food access here in our community. We live in a community that traditionally has been able to provide a great deal of its own food historically. And in 2014, we lost our grocery store. And since then, it's been really difficult for our community to access fresh and locally sourced food. Uh, And so it's been our work through the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production to bring our community back into a process in which we're using art and agriculture to engage our community in redesigning our food ecosystem for the 21st century. What have you been able to do so far? So we have started an artist residency space for working with artists from a five-state region that are helping us to engage rural issues like this across the region. Uh, We have started a small community farm on 17 acres of green space in the community, and we're working with our community now to redesign and redevelop a vacant building on Main Street to turn it into a commercial kitchen and cultural center. Tell us more about the garden. How is that going? How many people are involved? Well, we have a small farm apprentice program in which we have three young farmers that are being trained in sustainable agriculture. Uh, We hired a farm manager that is managing the 17 acres. That program is an 18-month program in which these young farmers are learning how to manage their own sustainable farming practices. Uh, And so we're growing cucumbers and squash and tomatoes, peas, butter beans, corn, zucchini, okra, sweet potatoes, and we're teaching a no-till sustainable method that is actually regenerative farming that is rebuilding the soil foundation versus taking away from it. What made you get involved with Gulf South for a Green New Deal? Because I feel like the work that we're doing uh, is in line with the aspirations of that organization and, and that coalition, which is to look at issues of climate justice and connect them to the lives of everyday people. Uh, I feel like we don't often talk about climate justice in like the everyday community conversations, but we're recognizing that the seasons are changing. It's getting warmer. The storms are coming more frequent and are more powerful. We recognize that we're dealing with issues of of the ice storm that happened. Uh, There's just so many different environmental and climate issues that we're engaging uh, as a community, and we're creating a space in which we can talk about those issues in ways of how we deal with both the fallout and creating solutions to those problems through an interface, which is our organization, that puts these issues front and center, but also demystifies them, that it's not something that's happening at this big policy institute in D.C. or somewhere around the world, but we're dealing with what does it mean to engage in sustainable practices in our own backyard. Carlton Turner with the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about this initiative. Thank you, Desiree. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening. This is